Ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats, please. Welcome to the uh, first plenary session as, uh, uh, as part of this conference. Uh, we're going to have an excellent session for you this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about new techn technological strategies to save lives. Uh, and our first speaker is Marcus Ong from Singapore. Marcus, over to you. Buongiorno. I bring you greetings from uh, the Resuscitation Council of Asia and uh, also the Asian Association for EMS. And uh, my name is Marcus. I'm an uh, EMS um, medical director in Singapore, as well as an emergency physician and a researcher. These are my conflict of interest disclosure. So we're going to talk about technology and how this relates to cardiac arrest and specifically recognition. And I'd like to start off with a story. So meet Mr. Tan. Mr. Tan is the, um, el the older gentleman who is standing there on the left. And, um, you know, the man on the right is Peter. And Peter was having a, a bowl of his favorite beef noodles, you know, so it's Asian style uh, spaghetti bolognese. And um, all of a sudden, he heard a lot of commotion at the back of the, the restaurant. And what happened is the, Mr. Tan, the owner of the, the restaurant, had collapsed with cardiac uh, arrest. And uh, Peter had never been to a CPR class in his life, but um, he got out his phone and called 995, which is the emergency number in Singapore. And over the phone, the dispatcher was able to recognize a cardiac arrest and give him instructions to start chest compressions. And you can see at the bottom left corner that uh, the closed circuit TV camera actually captured him following instructions from the dispatcher to do CPR. And the good news is that um, by the time the ambulance arrived, it was VF, they managed to restart the heart. And um, a few days later, Mr. Tan was discharged from the hospital uh, intact neurological function. And we had a simple ceremony at the restaurant where, you know, Mr. Tan had a chance to thank Peter, and his reward is uh, free beef noodles for the rest of his life. So let me introduce you to my EMS system. Uh, we are a small city-state um, in Asia, um, and you can see population about 5.6 million now. Multicultural, multiracial, uh, multiple languages. Um, we have 60 emergency ambulances that covers the population about now probably 180,000 calls or transports per year, more calls than that, and about 300 active paramedics. And what I'm going to share uh, today and tomorrow are part of a uh, strategic national IT blueprint that we did for pre-hospital emergency care about uh, two years ago. And uh, this was a year-long study where we looked at our pre-hospital and emergency care climate. We looked at what was the best practice and technology out there. And then we looked at, you know, delivering a five-year blueprint for our local EMS system. And that included funding for pilots and a full-scale implementation. So um, I'll be sharing with you some of the interesting technologies that uh, we reviewed and with a main focus on what we have actually started to implement and what is doable today and not tomorrow. And to give you an idea, you know, that this covers the entire landscape of the pre-hospital environment, starting from uh, before a patient calls, so in the community out there, early diagnosis, uh, public education, to what happens at the dispatch center or the control room, you know, technologies around locating the patient, improving situational awareness, recruiting community volunteers to actually start, for example, CPR or use a defibrillator, and um, improving communications, looking at the ambulance portion, being able to link the ambulance with the hospital and how to manage data along that. And tomorrow I'll be talking more about the ambulance and the uh, hospital link of this. And then finally, you know, the bringing that together in a data warehouse and being able to use that for quality and to drive innovation. And you can see here some of the technologies that we've reviewed. And I only have 20 minutes, so I'm not going to be able to do the full spectrum review of all these technologies. We are going to focus today, uh, this afternoon, on the pre-community uh, piece and also the dispatch. And then I'll leave the ambulance and the uh, post-PEC part for tomorrow. So I'd like us to remember that it takes a system to save a life. And while it's nice and sexy to talk about technology, um, 
there's both the hardware component, for example, AEDs out there in the community, software, you know, things like apps, uh, which I'll share more about. But actually, the important piece is the hardware, which is ac having active citizens that are willing to be part of your emergency response system. And the control room actually plays a vital link to be able to bring all these pieces together and then you know, be it a bridge to your emergency first response. So in Singapore, what we do is we send a motorcycle-based first responder. We are a big urban city, high-rise building, high traffic, and you know, the, a, a motor, motorcycle vehicle actually can get there in half the time and bring an AED before the ambulance arrives. And we have built our technology to focus around the community first responder. And part of that is a public education program that we call the Dispatcher Assisted First Responder Program. We call it DARE for short. And again, this is a part of a play on psychology. And we've spent a lot of time thinking about this, you know. So Asians, we are very shy, you know. I don't know about in, in Italy, but uh, when you sit down for a meal, you don't eat first. You say, grandfather eat, grandmother eat, father eat, grandmother, uh, mother eat, and then you eat, right? So in public, when somebody collapses from a cardiac arrest, it's the same thing, you know. Anyone can do CPR? Uh, no, sir, after you, you know, after you, you know, after you, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not worthy, you know, to do CPR, you know. So the messaging is a psychology to say that, you know, um, there to save a life, it could be your, your family or your loved ones. And don't worry, if you can't remember what happened during the lesson, uh, the dispatcher will actually guide you Today over the phone. Today we're going to learn all about cardio A little bit more on the volume, please, thank you. Everyone can do it if you dare. Call 995. Stay on the line. A medical dispatcher will Hi, instruct you. Start CPR. Interlock your hands and push. Push hard and push fast. Get an AED. Continue to push hard and fast while you wait for the ambulance to arrive. So I suppose you're tougher and more daring now. <laughs> Goodbye. So keep the message simple, you know, only three things you need to remember, stay on the line, push hard, push fast, use an AD. And as we talk about cardiac arrest recognition and the tools and technology, um, again, I want to emphasize that this has to be part of a system that is saving lives, you know. And uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to talk about the story of uh, dispatcher assisted CPR in Singapore. So actually, we've had a software that actually gives a protocol for dispatcher instructions since 2012. And we bought the system, we had it installed, you know, uh, we trained all the dispatchers on it. Any impact on bystander CPR? Yes, no, nothing. No improvement at all in bystander CPR rates. And so we were scratching our heads and trying to figure out why, you know, what, what was actually happening, you know. And it was only when we began to actually link case-by-case uh, -case audit and feed back the results of that audit in an implementation process to all the dispatchers that we started to see an impact on the ground. And uh, this included basically courses to train the, the dispatchers, you know, and weekly in-service refreshers. But I think the most important ingredient of this was that we pull up the tapes for each and every single cardiac arrest, 100% case review for cardiac arrest. And we'll listen to the tape during that same shift, usually on a night shift, and we'll feed that back to our dispatchers uh, at the end of the shift, you know, so if you had a cardiac arrest call during the night, you know, the supervisor will pull up the tape and I have nurses that sit in the dispatch room as well and we'll actually go through and everybody will listen to the tape, you know, have some reinforcement of learning and then after that, you know, encourage them to do better the next time and we've linked that with uh, rewards, you know, your, your incentive, your bonus or whatever it is, you know, uh, we have a wall of uh, honour for dispatchers who have had a safe, confirmed safe, you know, in, in our dispatch centre. And we've actually set hard KPIs, you know, that uh, they aim to diagnose and dispatch within a minute, have CPR started by the third minute. Uh, we set a target for improving our bystander CPR rate, you know, and of course, quality measures for CPR. And this is linked to a data collection system that is part of our National Cardiac Arrest Registry. So we'll actually listen to all these tapes, review that information, link that to the ambulance record, link that to the hospital outcomes, and that is part of our National Cardiac Arrest Registry. So, uh, let me emphasize that all this is part of your data-driven improvement cycle, you know, where you uh, define what is the problem, measure it, you analyze it, you bring improvement to the system, and then you review, and then you, you work at that cycle again. How about the human element of this, you know, and for this I'd like to credit my colleague YY, who, is, uh, who was the medical director of the uh, fire service, you know, and what we have learned basically is that when you are the dispatcher over the phone and you're trying to give instructions, this is the greatest exercise in sales technique. 
Okay, and I'd like to share with you three important sales techniques, you know. So the first is called authority, right? So the dispatcher has to come from a point of authority. You know, you do not say, can you please do CPR? You know, you say, uh, I'm, the, I'm the dispatcher, please listen to me, and I want you to start CPR now, right? So take a position of authority. The second principle is what we call reciprocity, okay? So again, most people will not do something for nothing, right? So you have to offer something in, in return, right? So, sir, I'm going to send you an ambulance. The ambulance is on the way. But in return, I would like you to do something for me, which is, can you help me to rescue the patient? Okay, so that's reciprocity. I, do, I, I rub your back, you rub my back, right? The last principle is that of momentum. Now, if you want to make a sales pitch, you know, you're walking by the shopping mall and say, would you like to buy a house? Most of you say no. But if I tell you, would you like to win a free all expenses plate holiday to visit this bungalow or this villa? You say, maybe, you know. And then, uh, can I show you some pictures of this villa, right? Yes, right? And then, uh, you know, if, uh, would you like to bring the family and then we'll, we'll get a consultant to attend to your needs, yes? And very soon you're signing on the dotted line, right? So it's the same thing in uh, dispatch assisted CPR, you know. Sir, can you do something for me? I would like you to put your phone on speaker mode. Yes, I can do that. I would like you to kneel by the side of the patient. Yes, I can do that. I would like you to put your hands in the center of the chest. Yes, I can do that. I would like you to pump hard and pump fast, and I'm going to count with you, one and two. And very soon, you're doing CPR, right? And so it's like a snowball that gains momentum. So we actually do a lot of training for our dispatchers into the psychology, how to manage someone you know, who is uh, a layperson, who is confused, panicky, and anxious. And again, we tell them, you know, there are some things that you should never say, don't do. It's like asking a marriage proposal, right? And, uh, you know, you need to say the right words. You can either get a slap on the face or you'll get the, the answer of your life, right? So don't, don't ask them, do you know CPR? Of course, the answer will be no, you know. Can you do CPR? Of course, why should I, right? So instead, you know, uh, use those three principles that I've talked about. And we've also now a lot of experience analyzing our own data on what are the barriers for CPR. And we've... Uh, incorporated some of those into our protocols. So one of the things that uh, I would uh, share with you and encourage that you do if you do work uh, with dispatchers is what we call closed loop feedback. You know, so for each and every case, as I mentioned, it goes into our cardiac arrest registry. We make sure that the information goes back to the last man on the line. In other words, the dispatcher will get an incident report that says, well done, you, know, you attended to this case on this date, this time, that person has su uh, survived to discharge. You know, and you get a commendation for that. We also use the media to highlight our successes, you know, and uh, the person on the right is actually a volunteer that was coached to actually uh, start CPR and the patient survived. And then we'll feature our dispatch staff, you know, and make sure that they feel appreciated. And so here's where the technology is. Uh, we, in the last two years, we have launched uh, uh, what we call My Responder. So if you're interested, you can look at that at the Google Play and Apple Store. Um, you can download that, you know. Um, and it does three things. So number one, you can actually activate an emergency call. It will actually auto-dial 995 and put you on speaker mode so you can start to talk to the patient hands-free straight away. Number two, if we recognize that it's a cardiac arrest, uh, it will actually activate a first responder within 400 meters. And we now have 30,000 volunteers who have the, the downloaded the app. They are, they are actually on the system and we track them. And to date, we have more than 2,000 responses for cardiac arrest. Uh, and in about half the time, we are first hands on chest, and about 5% of the time, we've actually delivered defibrillations. So the other piece of it is linking your responder app to your AEDs, right? And so here we have actually uh, started a national AED registry. Uh, we actually check and verify each and every uh, location of the, the AEDs, and we've linked that with a national program to put AEDs at apartment buildings. So my population, 90% of us live in high-rise apartments. And uh, I'm pleased to announce that today, every single one of the, uh, at least every, in every two blocks, we have one block with an AED located. And that's at the elevator uh, on the ground floor. It's covered by closed-circuit cameras. And some of you might be asking me, Marcus, how did you manage to get uh, all these AEDs? So I have one word for you, gambling. <laughs> so we, we actually went to the National Lottery Board and asked for um, you know, support for the AED program. So the next time you come to Singapore, please visit our casinos and support my AED program. So we call this registry ready, you know, again, play on the psychology and, uh, you know, find, verify and map them. 
Part of our experience, I've told you, we now have 30,000 responders. And uh, I call this phenomenon the rise of the super responders. You'll find that out of the 30,000 volunteers, maybe about half of them have ever responded. But there's a small group of them, about less than 100 of them, that have done 30, 40, 50 responses within the last two years. You know? And uh, these are a special breed of people. So let me introduce you to one of our uh, responders. He's Mohammed Lukman. Uh, he was only 13 years old when he started, uh, 15 years old when he joined the program, and he has had almost, I think, 20 confirmed uh, saves. You know, so it's like the fighter pilot, you know, with the stars on the on the shoulder, right? So uh, think of again Spider-Man. You know, there are these people who, during their weekends, they will actually cruise around waiting for activation, and then when they get responded, they will run and go and grab the AED and go and save a life. And what we have started is basically. Uh, a club where we recognize all these super responders and uh, you know all our volunteers once a year we throw a party with free beer you know and then we'll bring the survivors and they will thank you know the people who have responded and everybody has a good time the press comes take photographs and that's how we maintain it and we build that into our public outreach program so again if you uh, check us on Facebook Twitter Google uh, you find that you know we actually spend a lot of effort to take care of our volunteers, maintain them, and build up that community. The other interesting piece of it is because the technology is there, we can actually build very innovative models of community first response. So uh, in my neighborhood, we have something called the Neighborhood Watch. So I don't know whether you guys have this in Europe or not. But these are people who spend their weekends cycling around the residential estate, right? And they report on the trash, the light is not working, they look out for crime, you know? And what we did was we trained these volunteers, equipped them with the app, and also an AED that's on their bicycle. So I told you 400 meters on foot, one kilometer on the bicycle, okay? And then you add another layer to that, we have now 500 taxis that are across Singapore that carry an AED. And again, we recruit them into our program. And if you're in a taxi, within two kilometers, uh, you would be activated to bring the AED for a cardiac arrest case. Uh, and again, we have a group of uh, maybe about 10 of those 100 taxi drivers that have done 10, you know, 15 responses, you know, and they are the super responder group. So again, very, very interesting social phenomenon. So these people will block on their Facebook and all that, you know, guess what I dis did this weekend, you know, take a photo with the survivor and, you know, showcase their, their, their successes. Um, we are also looking at our dispatch center on very interesting technologies using artificial intelligence to help uh, diagnose uh, calls. And I think the other one that has a lot of potential is a video call, you know, where, where you can actually use a, the, your phone to actually verify whether the patient is conscious or breathing. And we've started a small pilot in Singapore. Uh, this one is from my colleagues in Taiwan, Taipei, where they've actually gone live with a system. Uh, Korea, I know, also is playing with some of these. And I think these are very interesting and, and exciting technologies. The main limitation we have found is the bandwidth. You know? So if you are on 3G, you can't make it. 4G, but still a bit slow. You need LTE, basically. So you need quite a lot of bandwidth speed to actually support this. Um, and then finally, you know, um, I'm going to sh share something that uh, Dr. Freddie Lippert from Copenhagen shared about the, the uh, trial with 911, what is your emergency? I need help. I need an ambulance. Hey, Dad, what happened? Dad? Can you please verify your name and address and tell me what happened? Uh, yes, I'm Annie Robinson. We're at 1450 Bay Street, San Francisco. My dad was installing kitchen cabinets, and I think he knocked his head or something. I just heard a bump, and then he fell. I can't get him up, and he's not being responsive. Dad, are you okay? Oh my God, I think his head is bleeding. Oh my God. All right, give me one moment. Okay, an ambulance has just been dispatched and it's on its way to you right now. Okay. They'll arrive in four minutes. Okay. okay. And while we wait, can you tell me if your dad is conscious? Yes, I think so. Actually, no, I'm not sure. I can't tell. His eyes are open, but his face looks all weird. I, I guess he's conscious. I, I don't know. Okay, okay, hold on. All right, we need to make sure that aside from hitting his head, there's nothing else wrong with your dad. Does he seem to be breathing properly? No, actually, I don't think he's breathing right, but maybe he's just disoriented. I, I don't know. Okay, Annie. This is important. He may be suffering a cardiac arrest, so if you're not sure, I'm going to walk you through how to check his breathing. Oh my god. Oh my god, I thought he just fell and hit his head. Is he having a heart attack? 
then what do I do? It's okay. You can do this. Listen to me and stay calm. Can you make sure that he's lying flat on the ground and that he does not have any vomit or food in his mouth? Okay, yes. Um, hold on. I'm just going to put you on speaker. Hold on one sec, okay? Okay. Okay, I'm ready. Um, no, there's nothing in his mouth. Great. Now place your one hand on his forehead and your other hand under his neck. Okay, I'm just going to cut this short because of time, but uh, in case you're wondering, it is not the computer that's speaking, okay? It's, it's a real-life dispatcher. But what uh, this does is basically marry a few technologies that are, again, available today and not tomorrow, right? So there, uh, there's, of course, speech recognition, voice to text, and then using natural language processing to be able to recognize certain keywords. Behind that, there's probably a machine learning or neural networks kind of uh, algorithm that recognizes what combination of words has a high probability that this is a cardiac arrest? And then you have the ability to push some uh, pictures or whatever to the, the caller and actually guide them, right? So, like I said, this is technology that is available today, not tomorrow. Finally, um, what has been the impact of some of the things that I've been sharing? You know, so traditionally, our survival for cardiac arrest has been dismal, 2%. You know, when I started collecting national data in 2001, our survival was 2%. By the time of uh, 2011, we had gone up to uh, about 12%, and today our uh, survival is above 20%. You know? And the biggest, most obvious thing you can see here is the jump in bystander CPR. That has gone from 20% to over 50%, and we are consistently at above 50%. And a lot of that is uh, rec early recognition and starting of telephone instructions. And you can see the AED use has also climbed from 1%, now we are above 5%. So it's a five-fold increase in AED use, a two-fold increase in bystander CPR, and a ten-fold increase in survival over the last 10 years. Now, there's not many things in medicine that you can say you've had a ten-fold increase in survival. You know, for all that we've invested in genomics, in cancer research and all that, none of them have ten-year increase, uh, ten-fold increase in survival. So this is a field that I think technology has a very direct application. You know, it can actually be deployed fairly quickly and you can see results from it, you know, that uh, can actually change um, outcomes for our patients today. So I'll uh, close off with an uh, advertisement, you know, I'm actually uh, actively looking for postdocs and fellows to help me in a virtual Singapore project. What we're doing is we're mapping the whole country in 3D. So traditionally mapping and all that has been done in 2D, so, right? But this is 3D mapping external and within buildings, you know, to be able to uh, power uh, simulation modeling, virtual reality training and all that. So if you're interested, just come and talk to me or drop me a line. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus, for an excellent presentation and excellent way to start the conference. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir, they're at the back. Yeah. I think we do, yes. Uh, do we have uh, our audio guys? Can we get a microphone to the uh, questioner, please? Thank you. Hi, first of all, Kreimeyer from Munich. First of all, congratulations to this excellent studies and the results obtained. My question is, how do you ensure uh, the good quality of the first responders? How are they registered? Are they all nurses or doctors normally working in the hospital or how? Good question, sir. So I will actually talk more about that tomorrow, um, but it is not uh, restricted to only nurses or doctors. We take anyone, anyone can download the app. Uh, however, to be uh, on the system, number one, we link that with a government uh, registration, right? So in Singapore, we have something called e-government, which means that you can log on, you know, with your national ID to pay your taxes or to uh, value your property or whatever it is, right? So we use that ID for registration for our first responder app. In other words, we know who you are and we're not, because we send people into apartment buildings and into your home. So we need to know who you are, right, for that kind of reassurance of uh, safety and quality. So uh, we actually have a registration on each of these people. Uh, the other piece of it is we have linked that with our National Resuscitation Council and our CPR training. So today, uh, again, my, the chairman of my Singapore Resuscitation and First Aid Council, Sri Han, is here. Today, if you attend a CPR or First Aid class in Singapore, the very last slide that you'll see during that lesson is my responder. And now that you are trained, download this app and become one of our responders. So we have basically linked that uh, system of training everyone, and this is across the whole country. You cannot 
be a certified provider of uh, CPR classes without using my slides, right? So we have linked that with our recruitment. So most of recruits actually come from a CPR class and they're signed on onto that app. And then we push that out to our first responder community. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Any other questions? Whilst we're waiting that, can I just make an appeal to you all? This is a conference surrounding technology and resuscitation, and there appears to be a grand total of one tweet so far about Marcus's talk. <laughs> so, uh, Henry Wang, thank you. I, uh, you. You've done the one tweet that I can see. The hashtag is hashtag ERC18. Please tweet uh, and, and share the, the messages from the talks that you're going to hear over this conference. Thank you very much, Marcus. Yes, it's a great pleasure to me to call our second speaker, who is Matthias Ring from Sweden. And I ask you to give us your talk on enhanced community response. It's yours. Thank you. Dear chairs, ladies and gentlemen, Scientific and Organization Committee of the ERC. I'm honored to be here to give a talk of enhanced community response in out of hospital cardiac arrest. Um, I work as a senior consultant in the medical ICU. I'm a cardiologist. In my spare time, I do some research at the Center for Resuscitation Science at Karolinska Institute. These are more disclosures. In the 2015 guidelines, it was put uh, a lot of emphasis on the community response in our hospital cardiac arrest to save lives. This underscores the intrinsic and very important interplay between the dispatcher, the bystander, and also the ADs in, in the community. Uh, in light of new technology, I will use the chain of survival concept to enlighten the different chains and how they can be strengthened with new te technology innovations and also existing te technology that we have ready today. First of all, early recognition and call for help. This is a very innovative and very intelligent paper from our Danish friends that used recordings from CCTV when looking at out of hospital cardiac arrest and what actually happens. What we can see in these uh, sketches, in these uh, schematic sketches, the reality is not even like that. It's more complicated. Uh, there's the, the, the picture that we have, that there's a, a witness calling in and also doing the CPR has been challenged. There's a lot of people with the interplay in this process. And it's also very difficult for the dispatcher to see what really happens. And the author suggests that we should broaden the band of communication to also include video and speaker functions on the phone to really, uh, uh, to really access the scene from a dispatcher's perspective. So mobile phones can be used to transfer video, as Marcus was touching upon, but also we can use the applications in the mobile phones for CPR training and also lower the threshold to actually call 112 or doing the first actions. Recently, a big mobile phone manufacturer launched a new watch with the possibility to record ECG and detect atrial fibrillations. We know that most arrests proceed with warning signs, and maybe in the future we can also detect these kind of warning signs before the arrest happens. This new watch also have a fall algorithm. We can actually detect when a, peep, when a person uh, stumbles and fall over, and if you don't snooze it, an alarm goes off. Maybe this can in the, in the future be connected to different kind of systems to the dispatch center. Also, CCTV surveillance and artificial intelligence can be, can be used for this purpose. So what about early bystander CPR? 
How do we increase CPR rates? Of course, we can educate a lot of people and increase the awareness of society and, and knowledge. Of course, we can implement telephone CPR, dispatcher assisted CPR, and also we can change the guidelines. But what if we can use designated, motivated, highly trained lay responders that are close vicinity to, to the cardiac arrest? Uh, we thought about this in the beginning of 2000, and actually in 2005 we had the first system for this. We reached out to lay responders and we got a lot, uh, about uh, 10,000 people registered in the system. And as Marcus showed, when there's a cardiac arrest going on here in the football field, they dial 112. We dispatched the ambulance, firefighters, and police trucks. But we also have these designated lay re responders who've been um, voluntarily assigned to the, in the system. And we locate them with the mobile phone technology, the G GSM system at that time. And we sent those that were within 500 meters from the arrest for CPR. The system was really uh, functional and we wanted to evaluate this in a randomized controlled trial that was published in 2015. We randomized about 18, uh, 100 patients, but we ended up with uh, about 700 true cardiac arrest. And in one group, we, uh, we activated the system at the dispatch center, and in the control group, there was no activation. There was activation at the dispatch center, but there was no alarm sent out to the volunteers. And in those cases where the, that were randomized, we could see that the uh, uh, bystander CPR increased significantly but there was no uh, difference in secondary outcomes for survival. And this study was not designed to answer that question. But gladly, we could see that the intervention was more effective in residential area and in people's homes. So this was the first time that we can see we could use a system for dispatching of lay volunteers to people's homes. And that, uh, the significance of that I will return to later. So we have to ask ourselves, what is true bystander CPR? In how many cases do the witness or the lay persons beside the arrest really initiate true quality bystander CPR without assistance from the dispatcher, according to guidelines? I don't think that's a high percentage. So now we have systems for dispatching those lay responders, hopefully, they will provide better CPR, and hopefully they are well motivated. And we can use these kind of systems or applications also for CPR training. Maybe we can replace the, the um, uh, traditional CPR training with applications and retention of CPR skills. And also we can find solutions for quality of CPR when it's performed. And these solutions are emerging, and I think you can see in the exhibition area here. Uh, there are some quality CPR feedback devices in, in the shape of smart cards, where you actually uh, paste it on the, the chest and you can get real-time feedback on your CPR performance. And this can also be connected to video to smartphones and also to the dispatch center. So what about early defibrillation? How can we enhance early defibrillations in the light of new technology? We know that from the SAFAR lecture that uh, ADs or defibrillators have been present in the ambulances since the 60s and the development of the automatic AD or automatic defibrillator uh, has led to also dissemination to other systems like first responders, fire trucks, and police cars, and that has been implemented a lot in, a, in a several places around the world. And we have these famous studies from the 90s in Minnesota 
where they can uh, increase survival in, in uh, shock rhythms, for example. But we also have the trained response that we put ADs on, on site uh, with, uh, in places where the personnel have a duty to respond and take actions. For example, long haul flights or security officers. For example, the famous casino study. The next layer of public access defibrillation is the lay responders. They can be either trained or untrained. And this is the wide dissemination of ADs in society where it's put up in, in office buildings or supermarkets. There can be a trained response, but it can also be detached by a lay responder with no training at all. So we have a huge challenge in front of us. We know that for example, in Sweden, we have 40,000 ADs in society. We have 3 million people trained in CPR and AD use, but still the percentage of AD usage is really, really low. And the cause of it is that most of it, the other hospital cardiac arrest occurs at home where it's not reachable for these kind of interventions. But there might be a solution of that, of course. This is the first page paper where it integrated an AD registry together with a system for text message dispatch of lay responders. It used um, the same principle as, uh, as I showed before they dispatch people either for AD, uh, um, collecting the AD, or to the cardiac arrest directly to do CPR. In this study, there were about 900 alerts where the TM text message system was um, activated. And in 184 cases, a text message responder connected an AD. And the ECGs were collected from these ADs, and in 76 cases, there was a shockable rhythm, and probably the patients were shocked. Also in this study, the intervention was really effective in a residential area. So this is actually the first scientific proof that we can dispatch lay responders to people's home for applying an AD. This is a recent paper that I have to mention. It's um, from Japan, where they have a team of doctors and, and um, nurses, I think, mobile AD teams at road races, and they have a central for uh, dispatching them. So when a cardiac arrest occurred, the nearest mobile AD teams of running doctors uh, hurried to the victim's location. And this also underlines really the importance of early defibrillation. Of course, a uh, selected group of road runner, uh, runners, but as you can see, if the cardiac arrest were witnessed, all patients survived. So what has to be in place in order to use an AD? And how can modern technology or existing technology help us out to support these different steps. This is what I call the chain of public access defibrillation. It's a quite messy picture, but on top we have the recognition of our auto hospital car arrest by bystander or at the emergency dispatch center. If this is recognized as a car arrest, there has to be an AD available on site. This can, of course, be done by increasing the ADs but also to place them at strategic uh, place for strategic placement and using the geographical information system, for example, but also to place them at, at uh, sites that are accessible uh, around the clock. We know that a lot of the, a big, a large proportion of all the ADs are not accessible. If the AD is available on site, the bystander must be aware of the AD location. And that's, this can be addressed by signs, but also by AD registries in your phone, 
AD maps, or also it can be uh, uh, known by the dispatcher on maps. So the dispatcher can also direct the bystander to the AD. If this not is the case, the AD can re be retrieved by a mobile bystander that is are attached to one of these mobile phone systems. When the AD is on place, the bystander must be willing and able to use the AD. And this, this can be facilitated by CPR training and this also in applications. But it can also be uh, reinforced by the, the design of the AD and the usability to make it more, even more easy to use an AD. If the bystander wants to use the AD, it has to be operational. We know from studies that this is a problem. Battery can be uh, run out or, or electrodes can be old. And this can be, be um, uh, this can, with, with remote surveillance in AD registries, this, uh, this uh, problem can be solved and maybe also uh, um, just an, an upside for the AD regis the register holder or the, the person buying an AD to register the, the AD to get um, uh, messages, text messages, for example, with the uh, notifications to change batteries. So we put a lot on delay rescuers, uh, dispatching them to with different systems to potentially unpleasant situations. This is a paper from uh, Holland, investigating the psychological impact on dispatch lay rescuers performing CPR. And at baseline, this rescuer seems quite young. They often have a, a higher uh, degree of education. And the lay rescuers received a an, an, uh, an survey after they've been performing CPR. And they looked at the short-term psychological impact. And after 46 weeks, they were uh, uh, interviewed again. And as you can see, in the beginning, uh, some, the most patients had a, a bearable, uh, the most uh, lay responders have a bearable impact. Uh, a lot of lay responders had no impact at all, and some of them had the severe impact. But as time went on, they moved to non-impact or mild impact. There was no lay rescuers after 46 weeks that were in the moderate or severe uh, groups, which I think is very promising for, and it makes me, um, uh, have a good night's sleep when I think of all the people we send out to, to the cardiac arrests. Uh, one other question is to use smartphone applications that are emerging or stick to the old text message based system that we used in the, in the previous studies that I've been referring to. This is a, a study from the Ticino region where they compared a smartphone application and a text message system. And you can see that the smartphone application was in favor in, in terms of dispatching LA volunteers and also professional volunteers. So there's a lot of different solutions that are emerging using really the same technology with GPS-based location services and dispatch of LA volunteers and also having support for AD registries and dispatching people for either CPR or um, using an AD. But is it, is it a problem to get the lay volunteers engaged? From uh, Marcus' lecture, probably no. This are also our, our experience in, in Stockholm. Uh, since we released the, the new smartphone application, we have over 25,000 registered users only in Stockholm. And um, we also have the app going in um, Gothenburg and, and uh, Copenhagen. And you can see the, the registrations per week. It's been a steady state of about 100 to 500, but there's a peak in the week of 49. And this really underlines the importance of being out there on, on Facebook and social media. 
This was a, a doctor, a junior doctor, who got an, an SMS alert, and she ran to the, to the cardiac arrest and performed CPR, and then afterwards she texted on fe Facebook and really spread the world. And it was shared over nearly 20,000 times, and this, actually this incident led to that we got so many users registered within, within one week. So science is cool and science is uh, promising, uh, technology is cool <laughs> and, and um, promising, but we also have to do science to see if it really works. So we're planning to start a an, uh, an randomized control trial with the dispatch of ADs with this smartphone application this uh, autumn. So the conclusion is that CPR training, telephone CPR, first responder systems, public access defibrillation program, is the backbone of the community response. But new technologies have the potential to enhance community response by early warning and recognition of cardiac arrest. We can also provide support and feedback from the EDC to the bystander. Maybe we can increase the quality of CPR with, with feedback and also provide training for CPR and retention of CPR skills with mobile applications or other features. We can provide AD information support, AD registries, and public access defibrillation program with, with uh, registration of ADs, for example, in mobile applications. And we can also dispatch nearby lay or professional responders for aided retrieval or CPR. Of course, there are other ways of delivering ADs, but that I will hand over to the next speaker, Andreas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matthias. Um, the excellent talk is open for discussion. Do we have a question for clarification, or do you want to know something more interesting about the topic? Then please raise your hand. It's always Uwe. <laughs> is it okay that I ask another question? Is that, is that okay? okay, thank if you. If you're quick. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, how do the people then that uh, have got the alarm get into the apartment or into the house? Cause in most cases, we said 70% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest scenarios are at your home. So how do they succeed to, to come into the apartment very if good. there is no second person, for instance? It's a very good question. Um, usually, we, we put a lot of efforts to, to educate the dispatchers in order to include this kind of information in the, dis, in the, in the alarm that are sent out at first, at first time. Um, but, of course, there can be problems, um, but it, it, it was down to that, the information that are given in the call. So we're working on a solution that we can update the information and send out new information as, as the dispatcher receives it. But to start with, we, we try to include as much as information as possible to reach the victim, of course. Okay, Michael, the last question. Um, it's not a question, just a comment, uh, Marcus here again. So what we do is basically to emphasize the central role of the dispatcher. And the opportunity is that the, the app actually allows you to track where your responder is. So I can tell the caller on the phone, I want you to continue doing CPR. There's a volunteer that's coming, you know, he's two minutes away, and now he's knocking at your door. Go and open the door for him, put away the dog and then you open the door for the volunteer to come in. So the dispatcher actually will continue to be on the line and talk to the, the rescuer. And you can actually get through problems like opening the door, you know, getting the dog so that it doesn't bite the, the poor first responder and you know, um, coordinate all the actions together. It can be done. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you. Okay, we'd now like to uh, ask Andreas Clausen to come to the stand to give a talk. And whilst he's coming up,
First of all, Andres, can I just let you know that the timer at the top starts at 22 minutes, so can Brilliant. you finish by two minutes at the end to keep us on time? And then just very briefly, excellent Twitter activity starting now. There has been a request that speakers, if they have a Twitter handle, that they, play, uh, that they advertise that as well. And there are people from outside this conference who aren't here who are following events with keen interest. So keep the activity going, please. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much for uh, being able to come to Bologna. Thank you to the ERC organizing committee for uh, having me talk about the topic of flying ADs. These are my conflict of interests. And uh, I can't other than mention the uh, Dutch uh, studies. Matthias mentioned them. They're always a bit ahead of us, always doing a bit better. Um, I guess you're all familiar with this uh, video. Um, this was posted in 2014 and has an impressing 10 million views. Uh, really, really nice. And they're really, really fast as well. From dispatch to arrival, only 56 seconds. And they're measuring seconds by the thousands as well. Nice. Really inspiring. Uh, a few years ago now. If we look at the cardiac arrest out of hospital in Sweden, um, we've been working with ambulance services, dual dispatch using the uh, fire service and the police as well. And uh, the median response time within the ambulance service is 14 minutes. So a bit better using the uh, dual dispatch, triple dispatch, but something more has to be done. The hot runner, the SMS life-saving system, contributes to some extent. However, if we look at the population density within Stockholm in this case, and you can just figure um, how your population density varies in your countries or regions where you live. These are data from uh, Per Nordberg from uh, Stockholm as well, and you're looking at the Stockholm city. On the left-hand side, you have the cardiac arrests, and uh, on the right-hand side, you have all the fire stations, some kind of an infrastructure for perhaps implementing drones. So this is a map showing where people live, uh, it's not really showing where all the cardiac arrests uh, occur. Uh, summertime, the coastline is heavily inhabited uh, during a few weeks. And um, we know that the predicted probability um, is uh, in correlation with the response time, of course. However, these data are interesting because if you look at the slope, if you would to decrease time, by 10 minutes, going from 25 minutes down to 15, the slope isn't that steep as it is sh changing or shifting from 15 minutes coming down to five minutes. It's really steep slope and much, much uh, more lives to be saved in that kind of time period, so to speak. We have some data from the Stockholm area and on the west coast of Sweden as well. We know that a um, uh, when using an on-site AD, 30-day um, survival can reach up 70%, in line with the Casino study and many other studies by now. Uh, however, if you look at Sweden, Matthias mentioned that we have some 40,000 ADs in our society, and um, many are sold, but the red line shows that they're not really being used as we would like them to, only 2, pre two or 3% actually. So would the solution be to uh, have more defibrillators? Yeah, perhaps, probably, but we need something more. This is a, uh, a geographical informational system study that we uh, performed a few years ago now. On the left-hand side, you can see the response times, arrival time from the ambulance, Stockholm City shows blue, and where you find the yellow areas, you have 20 minutes of delay or even more within the orange or red areas. We asked the system to tell us, give us 10 optimal locations for putting up drones carrying ADs. And when we weight the uh, uh, ambulance response time and the incidence of cardiac arrest 50-50, it gave us uh, pretty, all the, all the locations were in urban areas within the city center. If we put more weight onto the uh, ambulance response time, if it's a long ambulance response time, 
but not that many, not that high incidence of cardiac arrest. We had drone suggestions in the rural areas. So uh, we had a, a pretty short time-saving effect, but a lot of cardiac arrest in the urban areas. And on the opposite side, we could actually save a lot of time in the rural areas, but not that many cases occur. This has been demonstrated within Salt Lake City County as well. And uh, as well, a mathematical calculation showing um, a drone system on the left with a one minute flight and on the right, five minute flight covering the area. Boutelier published in circulation last year. This is Toronto, Ontario. And you can see the um, blue dots, which are paramedic fire police stations, and the cardiac arrest, the red ones. A suggestion for pu putting up drones as well. And on the right-hand side, you see no-fly zones. So perfect putting up drones and calculating the, the uh, locations. And I would urge you to look into your cardiac arrest registers and do the same. Find your red spots, of course. And it, it's not obvious that this is a disadvantage, having these many no-fly zones. Because within a no-fly zone, these are helicopter bases or airports, you can actually have pretty good um, overview of what's happening using medical drones, ambulance drones. So we got some funding a few years ago, and um, it's really visually attracting, this, uh, just painting a drone yellow and putting some stripes on it. Uh, however, uh, we had to do a lot of things in order to get the applications uh, within the Swedish legislation in order to fly at all. And basically, we flew over a few days in a military area. Uh, we predefined flight corridors and put geofences around residential areas. So a lot of preparations in order to test this. Uh, we used a small AD. And um, we, um, uh, as we do in Stockholm, we have dual dispatch. The idea was to have the fire service be dispatched at the same time and take the drone back home. Results were published in JAMA, or, and um, when we calculated time saving, we had 19 minutes in these areas. When we actually flew the cases, we showed 16 minutes. So there seems to be a potential, but these are all historical cardiac arrest. This is not a prospective study. So what about optimal placence, placement? Yeah, it's uh, depending on the incidence of cardiac arrest, your red areas where you can find them, depending on historical, based on historical data. It's depending on the uh, ambulance uh, uh, delay and what the unmanned aerial system is able to do. How long can it reach, how far can it fly, uh, and what speed, etc. You would need some kind of communication with it using 4G, 5G, uh, LTE, for example. You will have to know your no-fly zones, geographical, meteorological conditions, etc. So uh, this year we've been working with another prototype. This is the third one, and um, we had a uh, had this on display in uh, the north of Sweden in, in April, and we had the opportunity to show this to the five prime ministers of Scandinavia uh, when they signed the deal that Scandinavia sh will be the first 5G region in the world. So if 4G is for transmitting video and tweeting from ERC, 5G is Internet of Things. And um, I will just go on and show you a short video showing the concept. Um, there you go. Each year in Sweden, about 5,500 people suffer from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, but only 600 survive. When these emergencies happen, it's important to act fast. But sometimes the ambulance services don't make it on time. Advancements in UAV technology and the use of the 4G and future 5G network makes it possible for us to create digital aerial infrastructure, which enables UAVs to reach remote locations. This infrastructure allows an entire network of UAVs and emergency services to be connected, controlled and corrected dynamically, 
by both the control center and the authorities. The UAV situational awareness will let it adapt its travel route depending on weather reports, changes in routes of manned aircraft, obstacles or no flight zones. As of today, rules and regulations haven't caught up with the advancements of UAVs as life-saving methods, leaving many people without the help they need. We want to see a solution where technology can be used to its full extent and as a service to society. This network will create information gathering and logistical solutions for everything from security, agriculture to healthcare. Together, we can enable the infrastructure of tomorrow. So we've been through a few prototypes, from the first one on the left to a few more. There's more on the way. Using vertical takeoff and landing devices, you can protect the propellers, you can present the AD on top, for example, you can extend the range, speed, so forth. So it's not really about the drone. It's more about safety, feasibility, and uh, having some kind of system that controls it all. Because we're working with aviation now. And uh, many parties are developing UAS traffic management systems, kind of coordinating this. If we are to have 10,000 drones in the air in Europe in 10 years, something has to control this with respect to civil aircrafts, uh, people on the ground, etc. So this is kind of the brain within it all. We need a drone with capabilities of reaching people during the first minutes. I don't really care if the drone is driven by electricity or whatever, if it weighs 500 kilos or one kilo, as long as it arrives within three minutes or earlier. We need legislations as well to support us. And the uh, European Aviation Safety Agency um, has have a proposal, and the EU Commission will discuss this uh, at the end of the year. So we need a drone, we need uh, a UTM, and we would need legislations to support this. Uh, and then we have to test safety and feasibility. So what's happening right now? Yeah, we have a, um, a qualitative study in Monus, which we are, uh, will be sending in shortly. We will do a national survey looking at uh, cardiac arrest data on a national level, finding the red areas on a national level. How many drones are needed in order to reach people within eight minutes in the whole of Sweden, for example. We need to develop the UAV UTM system together with different parties, uh, network providers, the dispatch center, etc. In order to start testing safety and feasibility we're not really even talking about a randomized study yet, but um, uh, is it safe or feasible to do this? So uh, just another perspective. We're talking about how much the drone weighs and how far it can fly, etc. What about the bystander on site? Most usually a, an elderly woman, 70 years old perhaps, 70% of all the cardiac arrests occur at home. So uh, what do the, how do they experience interacting with a dispatcher, telling them there's a drone on the way, uh, delivering an AD outside their house in the garden. So in this, this really small study, uh, Bologna Cycle 2 level, um, people didn't really think that the drone was an issue. It was much more hard to put it on the speakerphone, on the, the phone, or um, actually attaching the AD, for example. And if we look at uh, what we need to do, we need to actually show that this is safe. We need to show that we have a, a need for, for deploying AD drones to be uh, um, arriving within the first minutes. We need to show that based on historic data and prospective data. We need to show the authorities and other that the, we have uh, looked at the safety feasibility variables, um, looking at adverse events on the same level as the aviation um, uh, system does. So to uh, conclude this talk on flying ADs, um, this seems to be time-saving benefits using drones
for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest as compared to EMS. We believe there's the potential in using drone systems for other medical conditions, perhaps uh, epinephrine for uh, anaphylactis, etc. We need to understand uh, what are the optimal locations with regards to safety, feasibility, cost, effectiveness, um, and reaching the correct bystanders. Perhaps we should deploy heart runners alongside AD drones. So just get people running and then we will deliver an AD to them. We hope that uh, we will have a common uh, framework for legislations all over Europe so that we can um, be able to test these important uh, technology uh, systems. And we're planning for a clinical study uh, within the Stockholm area. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent and fascinating talk. Um, does anybody have a question uh, for Andreas? Uwe, do you have a question for Andreas? Yes, he does. Oh, we have another question down the front. Use the microphone. So Great. the initial contact is established between um, yes, the responder or that uh, witness, um, uh, at the, the person that witnesses the out of hospital cardiac arrest. So then the um, mobile phone of this person is localized by the emergency center, but by the um, call center. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And afterwards, how is it coupled that this um, uh, AED is delivered to the right place? Is it then? Goes it through the emergency center or goes it through uh, one by one from the mobile phone to uh, this uh, flying AED drone? This is going through the dispatch center as uh, all other cases, all other calls, all other, all other cardiac arrests. And uh, I've been in the uh, EMS services for 20 years and uh, sometimes we just know it's a priority A or one case and we uh, start driving northbound. Then uh, after a few minutes, we get more information on how to uh, uh, f reach the exact location. And this system is uh, pretty much the same. We had this system airborne within three seconds from dispatch to launch, three seconds. So um, perhaps too fast. Just get it in the air towards the right direction. Then we will get more information in order to find the caller. I guess this is being done in different ways in all over Europe and the world. Um, as for Sweden, they're enhancing the dispatch center in collecting the GPS coordinates from Stark. Thank you. I think we've just got one final very brief question from the front down here. Thanks. It is quite a brief question. So I think I saw there was about a minute and a half off the chest to fetch it. Are you aiming to go closer than 50 meters or is 50 meters a safety thing? Or is it just to land within 50 meters of the person? A really good question, really good question. If you look at the publications using people having to run to fetch an AD, um, you can see that people are looking at 100 meters. Mm. So um, I think it's reasonable to look at 50, 100 meters. That's what you would be able to, to uh, go out of your house, find a drone with a spotlight and uh, hovering. You can find it within, not, not introducing hands off intervals either. So. Uh, we don't really know. 50, 100 meters. It's different in all locations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Thank you. Okay, let's move on with a local speaker. May I ask uh, Giuseppe Ristano to come up to the stage and give us his presentation uh, beyond CPR feedback? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here at the ERC meeting, and especially here in Italy, in my country. Uh, this is my disclosure. So the presentation is about what's beyond feedback. Uh, I just want to start a look together at the definition of feedback. We know that the feedback is information about the reactions to a person's performance of a task 
and uh, it is to be used as a basis for improvement. So this is a well-known feedback loop. We do something, we measure what we have done, we analyze, and uh, we correct our performance based on, on feedback. So uh, this section is about the new technological strategies to save lives, and uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, all the devices that we can use uh, during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest uh, and show a great evolution over the last decades and m even more faster over the last years. So now, uh, mm, when I talk about device for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, I will focus more uh, mainly on defibrillators. Uh, defibrillators now are filling with different algorithms, feedbacks, and so on. So there have been a, a huge evolution from the first idea to use electrical therapy to restart the heart. This was the Ayman author was a big needle to be inserted uh, in the chest, and it was delivering uh, electrical current. So more or less was kind of pacemaker. And these were the first defibrillators. And uh, you all read in all the historical reviews that when uh, you had to use such a defibrillator, you were suggested to alert first the firefighters because it was very easy to, to get some fire. So, but today the defibrillators are not only a, a tool to deliver a shock, uh, there is something more. Um, modern defibrillator indeed could guide or has the potential to guide resuscitation. Uh, they can help to identify cardiac arrest, to, they provide prompts to the rescue, they monitor the quality of CPR, they minimize the pause in chest compression, and uh, potentially they can also identify the best timing for defibrillation, and this is the main uh, focus of, of my um, presentation. You all, when you think about C, uh, CPR feedback, you all probably uh, think about um, these accelerometers that uh, can provide information about the quality of CPR, and you all know uh, this paper from um, Gavin Perkins and colleague show uh, no improvement in uh, uh, survival uh, in system that were implemented with this feedback device plus uh, or without uh, the, the briefing. But we also know that from mannequin studies that these feedback devices are very useful because they can uh, really improve the quality of CPR. And also they are even more important uh, for the post-arrest uh, debriefing. If you can implement the debriefing with the data extracted by the defibrillators and with the information from the feedback device, uh, you really can improve the performance. And in, indeed, all the systems that were implemented with the briefing uh, and also with the data from the defibrillators, uh, they show an improvement in the perception of their own performance. They were motivated to improve the CPR skills, and indeed, they improved uh, chest compression quality. Uh, we all know that now the CPR feedback uh, should be considered in, inside a broader system of implementation, but they are really suggested for training and, of course, they are recommended for uh, the briefing after resuscitation. But uh, this feedback device probably has some limitations. So they provide only mechanical information about uh, the, the depth, about the chest compression fraction, but we don't have any physiological uh, feedback uh, about uh, uh, what we are uh, doing. So how about if I show you this case, what, what can you tell me? Uh, probably that this was a really good uh, CPR, was 18 minutes of CPR, and you know that the, the red line uh, identify the compression. So as you can see, the chest compression fraction was very high, um, almost 100% all the time, so very good. This is another example, another uh, case. And also here, mm, you can say that the chest compression fraction was very good and probably the whole performance was good. So but now let, let's see, uh, since I'm, uh, especially in Italy, I'm known as the swine emergency doctor, I couldn't avoid to show you this. So this was the first case, was a pig in cardiac arrest put in a running ambulance with a mechanical compressor. And of course, in that case, the, um, the chest compression fractions was really uh, a continuous uh, good compression. And this was the other case with a very good chest compression fraction uh, because of the help of the metronome from the, from the defibrillator, but the quality was much 
much lower. And here you can see that basically the, there was a huge variation in, in, the, uh, in the quality of the chest compression and indeed in the perfusion that we were providing. So why I show uh, you this case? Because uh, we really need something to, to know what we are doing uh, to um, restart the heart and preserve the brain. And we know that uh, we uh, can play the game only in the first minutes of CPR. And probably now the, the defibrillator that are, let's say, in the middle earth, so the defibrillator between today and tomorrow, the, the new one, uh, they uh, develop new technology to uh, answer to all these questions, so minimize interruption and, and first of all identify the priority of treatment and reduce potentially the defibrillation attempt uh, uh, that can be predicted to be uh, futile. We know that we need to reduce the interruptions, uh, the perishocks interruptions because they, they are um, associated with the, uh, lower survival. But we also know that we, uh, the, the, the glitter is the total amount of electrical energy that we deliver with the shock and the glitter will be the post-resuscitation standing. You all remember this study from Norway. This was the study that changed the 2005 guidelines, introducing the interval of CPR based on the duration of cardiac arrest. Um, but then when we talk about the priority of intervention, so defibrillation first or chest compression first, there were many other studies, and, and if you look to this last Cochrane meta-analysis, uh, basically no uh, uh, study showed um, a superiority of one intervention rather than another, so defibrillation first or chest compression first. But what we know is that uh, um, during anti cardiac arrest, the heart became more and more ischemic and contracted, and this is also um, can be seen uh, in the electrophysiology because the VF waveform became uh, smaller in the amplitude and the frequency. Uh, if we can provide good quality of CPR, so we perfuse the heart and we prime to, to defibrillation, and this again can be uh, observed in a continuous change in the ventricular fibrillation waveform that became again with wider and uh, uh, with more frequent peaks. So the idea to predict and and uh, the defibrillation success and do, to guide the priority of intervention based on, on waveform analysis uh, has been uh, um, attractive for more than uh, 30 years now. And there have been many retrospective studies done on, on ECG databases uh, in which several um, BF waveform algorithms have been studied. And this is one, uh, at least, uh, several uh, different groups and show that this is one of the most accurate. And uh, I'm not going to uh, discuss about the mathematical equation. I just want to let you know that now there are available defibrillators that can measure this uh, in real time, these uh, uh, predictors of defibrillation success called AMSA. And what you can see is a number. When the number is high, you have very high probability of success of defibrillation. When it, uh, the number is low, you have a high probability of failing the defibrillation. This has been tested in pigs. Uh, then uh, in my group, we have run these uh, large re uh, retrospective studies in uh, our region in Lombardia, uh, which uh, was used mainly to discover the threshold level, so how we can use this, this approach. And uh, we found a few, uh, two cutoff, one 6.5, which is predictive of, of a failing defibrillation, with a predictive value of 99%, and one is a high value, 15.5, which can predict a successful defibrillation with a positive predictive value of higher than 84%. So that means that if we have an AMSA greater than 15, uh, 84 defibrillation out of 100 will be successful, getting ROSC. We confirmed those cutoff value also in another database from US, and more importantly, we also observe the correlation uh, between the quality of CPR and the change of AMSA over time. So if we provide a good quality of CPR, we perfuse the heart and AMSA increase. Otherwise, uh, it will uh, decrease over time. And this is a case from our database in, in Milan. This is a patient uh, who received three shocks, so uh, three, uh, mm, three ends of interval and two futile shocks. 
But if you look to the uh, answer value on the right, uh, we could uh, uh, predict the failing shock in the first two rounds. So in this case, we could just uh, keep going with chest compression, waiting for the higher value. I also uh, look at the knowledge gap from ILCOR. Uh, the, uh, the topic of fibrillation waveform analysis uh, has been discussed, and uh, you can read in the consensus on science that it's stated that there are no prospective studies. But in the second paragraph, if optimal defibrillation waveform and optimal timing of shock can be determined in prospective studies, it would be possible to deliver, uh, to prevent delivery of unsuccessful high energy shock and minimize myocardial injury. So starting from our um, knowledge and our experience with AMSA and also with the input from the uh, knowledge gaps, uh, we uh, designed uh, a study focused on the uh, shockable arm of uh, the LS algorithm, and uh, it's called amplitude, uh, um, amplitude spectrum area to guide the fibrillation during cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the AMSA trial. Uh, it will be a randomized controlled trial, and uh, the, first, um, the, the first day of enrollment uh, has been, uh, uh, it will be the 1st of November. Uh, it's a study uh, that uh, felt uh, within the larger uh, European funded project, EscapeNet, and uh, also it was supported uh, in part by Zoll for, for the production uh, of the device. Um, these are the cities where the patients will be enrolled, and Bologna is one uh, of those cities. All the shockable, adult shockable uh, cardiac arrest will be uh, included, and patients will be randomized to uh, AMSA guided CPR or standard CPR. Uh, we plan to enroll 388 patients. Uh, the primary point uh, is the termination of ventricular fibrillation uh, with achievement to ROSC for an AMSA greater than 15.5. Then we, we have uh, uh, other secondary endpoints, number of defibrillation, uh, release of troponin uh, as a, a readout of myocardial damage, and outcome. Uh, this is uh, uh, the flow chart. Uh, uh, can be um, difficult uh, to, uh, to look at, but basically, uh, when we arrive to the patient, uh, one rescuer will start chest compression while the other uh, prepare the defibrillators. When the defibrillator is ready and the pads are on, then we will look to the AMSA. If the AMSA is uh, above 15.5, we defibrillate immediately, otherwise we start the two minutes of CPR. So in this way, we prioritize the first intervention. Then after the, the first cycle of CPR, uh, uh, we look only to the the threshold for predicting failing defibrillations. So if AMSA is above 6.5, we defibrillate. If it's below, instead we don't defibrillate, but we keep going with a second uh, cycle of two minutes of CPR. After the third cycle for, for ethical um, issue, we, we, we have just to deliver the defibrillation. But then, uh, um, so in this way, we might avoid um, some futile shocks. But also, we, uh, if during the two minutes of CPR, the uh, AMSA reached the value of 15.5, so we can uh, anticipate the defibrillation, so shock uh, first the patient and, and uh, luckily uh, have uh, um, an earlier ROSC. Uh, this is uh, the device that we are going to use. Uh, those devices are not uh, available. They uh, were just made only specifically for this study. Uh, you can see it's just a regular defibrillator, but the difference is here, because there will be uh, the AMSA value uh, calculated in real time, and uh, it will update uh, every three seconds. Uh, this is uh, another case, for example, with a fine VF, in which you can see that the value of AMSA is very low. Of course, uh, AMSA will be, can be read only if we don't uh, compress the chest, so we are gonna adopt the 32-2 approach, and AMSA is read during the pause for ventilation. Here is a pause of ventilation, and we can see uh, the AMSA value, and then we decide how to proceed. So with this approach, that will be the first prospective study that will prospectively test this intervention. Um, we hope that we can prove that we are able to deliver the shock when it is most effective, and we can minimize futile electrical shock, and hopefully 
uh, improve ROSC. So with that, I finish. I just want to tell you that probably current and, and future feedback defibrillators are a, a link between uh, chest compression and defibrillation and can be a support uh, for a guiding uh, high quality resuscitation efforts. Thank you very much. Giuseppe Grazie for an excellent talk. Uh, and as we are running out of time, I will allow one question to our speaker. Do we have questions in the auditorium? It seems no, then I will hand back to Andy. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I noted that you called yourself the swine emergency physician. I thought you were saying you were the wine emergency physician. That's my title. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We have 15 minutes. Please visit the sponsors. Uh, go and refresh yourselves and then be back, hopefully, into this room because in 15 minutes, we'll be covering some major, major studies that have come out this year. Thank you for your time and participation. Thank you very much. <laughs>